Hey, hey, what's up, garden friends? Jeff here, how's everybody doing? Hope you're doing well. I'm great, fantastic. It's a beautiful day, and I'm getting around to filming a video on this power palm, as you can see in the title. This is a plant where I have attempted this video three times now, and every single time comes out way too long, like 45 minutes to an hour long. I try and base the care videos off of the questions that I get about the plants. The questions I get about the plants for things I emphasize a lot, and then the vid, it just, it got, it's too much. 45 minutes to an hour, and that's with an outline. Seven page outline. That's how many questions I get about this freaking plant. Here's the thing though, nobody wants to watch a 45 minute to an hour long video on a parlor palm, it's not gonna do that. I'm gonna blast through all my bullet points. This is a fairly straightforward plant. The parlor palm, Chimaduria elegans, sometimes called the Neanthabella, sometimes parlor is spelled with a U, all the same plant. Okay, well, I'm zoomed in like this. Let's throw the quick care up here for people who don't want a long video. We'll say three to four feet tall indoors parlor palms, like low to medium light, bright, indirect light is the way to go. Only a little bit of direct sun. These cook very quickly if they get too much light. They prefer a well-drained, organically rich soil that has some moisture holding capacity to it because they are a plant that does like to be consistently moist. Water them like a typical house plant. Allow the top two inches of soil to dry in between waterings. Reduce watering in the winter time. Allow them to dry out more. This is just little seedlings. Don't let them dry out at all between waterings. Keep them evenly moist at all times. Not heavy feeders when it comes to fertilizer and all purpose is fine do that every other week to once a month that's all that they need the higher the humidity the better but average household humidity is 30 to 40 percent generally they're fine with that as long as there's an air blasting on them burn as desired you'll have to because they tend to hold on to old brown foliage a lot you pot every probably two to four years somewhere in there be careful to not over pot these they do well with average household temperatures in 68 to 72 fahrenheit somewhere in there the core of the temperatures, the less water you want to give the plant, the warmer the temperatures, more water you want to give the plant. Same thing is true with light. More light, more water, less light, less water. Non-toxic, easy to grow, slow growing. It's not going to outgrow your house overall. I think that these are fantastic palms to keep inside, but they do come with an awful lot of questions. And I think that that's just because they tend to be very mass produced. They germinate from seed very readily, so they're sold very commonly. So a lot of people have them. The more people have a plant, the more problems may arise because all the different factors involve different growing conditions and whatnot. Of all the things that probably need the most emphasis with a power palm, it's going to be that how you take care of it is going to have some variability. Like I said during the quick care, more light, more warmth, more water, less light, less warmth, less water. They tend to be over potted a lot from pictures that people send me and they're like, what's wrong with them? Sometimes the containers that people have these things in are just gigantic, which is easy to do with plants that are typically sold fairly small. You don't see power palms for sale in a container larger than three gallons very often. At least I don't often see them in any container that's bigger than 10 inches. It happens, but they tend to get kind of pricey when you get up there. Usually they're sold in a little four inch, six inch, and gallon size up to 10 inch containers. So remember the container for the palms House plants in general only needs to be about an inch to two inches at the max on the outside diameter of the root ball. So let's say this orange pot is the root ball, then the container that it needs to go in shouldn't have any more than about that much space on the outside of it. That's just enough room for some fresh soil, some space for those roots to stretch out. If it's too much, then the water will move away from the root ball when you water the plant and it's not going to grow very well. It could even die. Then another important thing to note here would be just the care varies. We see the tags on these things. Oftentimes these get reputed as being plants that do well indoors because they like indoor conditions, and that is true. But it's still a tropical plant, a short tropical plant, which tells us that this is a plant that grows in very humid areas, right? The closer you are to the ground in the forest, the less light the plant's going to get, and the more humidity there's going to be because that moisture comes up from the ground in the areas that these plants come from. Yet they're still tolerant of indoor conditions, which I think is pretty awesome. The strong air blowing on them, especially dry air, gonna end up with brown tips because that's not, you know, they, they don't like that. These get the brown tips fairly easily. I think that people buy these as a beautiful green lush plant and then they get it home and you start to get some of those brown tips. Then it doesn't look so pretty anymore and just automatically assume been doing something wrong. And that's not usually the case. Increasing humidity will help with that an awful lot. And then the next one's watering. That's why I've emphasized the highs and lows and how to do all of that. The main thing is that when you buy these when they're smaller, which a lot of us do, they're going to need more water because they only have like one or two roots on them. Allowing them to dry out can 
be a lot more devastating to the plant. They get larger and more established like this one. I don't worry about watering these anywhere near as much. During the winter time, this one gets watered maybe I'd say every two to three weeks. Call that once a month and it's in a growth space that's very warm and humid so that helps because the humidity right don't have to water it as often. In the house I would probably be watering it about every 10 to 14 days somewhere in there because they do like moisture but if it's not really warm you can let them dry out and they're pretty tolerant of that once it's a larger more established plant. When they're smaller that's just, it's not going to work out. So the smaller the newer younger the plant is the more moisture that plant is going to need. So you really need to stay on top of that maybe a self-watering container might be the way to go avoid having these sitting in stagnant water even though they do love moisture you can grow these very easily in an aquaponics type situation or a hydroponic situation because they do like the moisture typically that water needs to be moving for them to thrive if it's sitting in a drainage dish that's in contact with the bottom of the container it's going to wick that moisture back up and if the soil's already saturated, then you can have issues with bad anaerobic bacteria forming and things leading to problems like root rot. Again, that's general house plant information. If you don't grow other house plants, that's a good one to know. Something else to watch out for when it comes to watering the plant is to make sure that the soil hasn't lifted from the edge of the container. It's in a really peaty or coconutty based mix. When those dry out, they tend to compress. Then you have a gap where when you water the plant, it's just gonna rush right around that. That doesn't help anything. Put the plant in a bucket or something, set the whole thing in there, fill it with water, and let that wick back up and fully rehydrate if that were to happen. So to wrap that up, to make sure if the plant's not getting overwatered, make sure that there's good drainage. So there's a nice hole in the bottom of the container or multiple holes that water can move through there. And that you're using a potting mix that isn't really thick and muddy. I like to use a blend that's pretty airy. What I have in here is just a standard all-purpose potting mix that I probably added in total volume, maybe 20% coconut chunk to. There's some pumice, some perlite. There's a good amount of sand in there. Compost, some earthworm castings, and I just like it to be dark, rich, and airy, but still with some moisture retention. That way I don't have to water the plant non-stop. There's a happy place you want to find when it comes to keeping the plants hydrated, right? Good palm for low light conditions, but the more light, the better, just not direct light, like with it, what it's getting right now. But that's just for the sake of the video, so y'all can see what's going on. When you look at these fronds, they're very thin, very delicate, very graceful and beautiful. You want them to be more deep green than this. We'll talk about why mine are this color later on. The light they get, the more of a yellowish appearance you're going to have on the foliage on these. I only let these get direct sun for, I don't know, maybe an hour or so in the morning. I keep my power pump over here in my tortoise garden, tucked right over here in the corner. It's been a good spot for it. It gets dappled light that comes through everything, so it doesn't have any strong, harsh rays on it, like just burning the fronds at all times. They're pretty sensitive to that. And when it comes to fertilizing, not a heavy feeder. An all-purpose is usually fine for these. You can, of course, use something like palm gain, something that's made for palm trees, where you're going to make sure that the plant's getting the appropriate nitrogen, potassium, magnesium, iron, sulfur, and all the other micronutrients, minerals that the plant's going to need to produce nice, healthy, lush foliage. With palm trees, we're watching out for the potassium and manganese, iron, boron, molybdenum, word I cannot say. Those are things you want to see in there. And the smaller the plant, the more delicate those roots. The roots on these are a little bit delicate as far as palms are concerned to fertilizers. So diluting the fertilizer to a half strength if you're going to be fertilizing frequently is probably a good idea. If you're going to be fertilizing, I would say, every two weeks you can cut it in half and that would probably be a good idea pardon the background noise have a fan running to cool the camera off so it doesn't overheat the sun's pretty intense today it comes to humidity they're pretty tolerant of indoor conditions 30 percent or higher the higher the better also the higher it is the more airflow you want around the plant not directly on the plant the lower it is the, the you need to be careful make sure that the moisture is not being blown right out of these thin pinnae these thin little fronds skinny leaves that just blows the moisture right out of them very prone to brown tips. Good ways to increase humidity. The best way to increase humidity is to get a humidifier. Another option would be to surround the plant with other plants that are, I was gonna say like-minded, but plants that have similar preferences. Spathophyllums and self-watering containers, great options. They have all that moisture around there. The plants release moisture, the soil stays moist. Overall, I wouldn't stress too much about humidity with the plant unless you live someplace really dry and arid. The only thing you may have to be concerned about when it comes to humidity with the plant is going to be the brown tips or potentially spider mites. We'll 
talk about pests more towards the end of the video. Main thing I would suggest would be to avoid misting the foliage on these. They tend to get spots on them very, very, very easily. They're prone to bacterial and fungal rots down inside the crown, and because these plants tend to be packed so tightly together, it can just be a problem. So I would avoid it. Okay, now, pruning. Get asked about that a lot. These are considered a self-cleaning palm, meaning a palm that will age out its old foliage and that will start to yellow and brown, dry up, and then it should fall off on its own. It doesn't usually fall off on its own when you have these indoors. If you're seeing discoloration, this is where the video ended up getting really long. I'm gonna try and keep this clear and concise. If you're noticing discoloration on a leaf, check and see if it's the oldest frond on the trunk. So look at the trunks. Get it nice and close there, closer than that. The oldest growth will be the lowest growth because these produce from the, they go like that. Hopefully that made sense. If that frond that's discolored is one of the oldest ones, I wouldn't stress about it unless it's like a bright yellow color, then it could be a nitrogen deficiency. Another thing we'll dive into later in the video. Otherwise, about once to twice a year, I usually do have to come in and give the power palm a prune because they hold on to their old foliage for a pretty long time even when it's dried up. And their crown, meaning the part of the palm that pushes out new growth up in here, this isn't one that holds on to a lot of fronds at one time. So in order to make energy to produce new ones, they will pull from the old ones and let those go. Go ahead and cut them off. It's not going to hurt the plant. All right, what about dividing? Get asked about that an awful lot too. The whole video are things I get asked a lot about. I would give them a good soak in water, place the entire container in a bucket, some sort of container, for probably 15 minutes to half an hour, you wanna do that to make sure that the roots are really hydrated, then pull it from the container, gently work the soil out from those roots. Chopsticks are really useful for detangling the roots from each other and then repot them. You can divide them up because they're not a clustering palm. Even though they look like it, it tends to just be a lot of seeds scattered in one place. A lot of the smaller palms that are in here are only in here because this produces seed about once a year and then it drops some and some of them come up. So that's why I continually have tiny little babies in here. It's another fun thing about the palm I should have talked about is they will produce an inflorescence and they seed. And the seeds produce very readily on their own. You don't have to do, the, not, I'm not gonna go into all that. It's just, it's a fun palm tree. And how often to repot? That's going to depend on, well, your palm tree and how it's been growing. I look for signs of stalled growth. So the plant's just hanging out when it should be growing. There's maybe roots showing from the surface of the soil or the bottom of the container, maybe both. You water and fertilize, do everything you're supposed to be doing, but just nothing's happening. That generally means it's time to bump it up into a slightly larger container, get some fresh soil down around the roots of the plant. There's no specific time frame for it. Generally, I repot a power palm once they reach this size, probably every, I'd say, two to four years. It's only to get fresh mix in around the roots of the plant. Potting mix doesn't have a lot going on with it in general. You're almost growing things hydroponically depending on what type of mix you're using. That's why I like to add earthworm castings and compost to help keep lots of nice microbes down there around the roots of the plant. But over time, those things break down, become muddy. Then there's not as much oxygen around the roots of the plant so that every few years I have to repot. You can probably keep them potted in the same mix longer than that. These are actually surprisingly cold tolerant. I have even had them return for me when I've had them in the ground with a lot of mulch on top of them here in zone 6B. And that was also a very mild winter in a very warm spot in the garden. Not necessarily going to call it cold hardy because they do have very delicate thin fronds. Frost will cause damage, but if you have a more larger established plant, usually the trunks will be okay with frost, but still I like to move mine inside once temperatures look like they're going to be dropping below 38 degrees Fahrenheit, or if they're going to stay below 45 or 50 for an extended period of time. Overall, it is a tropical plant though, and they prefer to be indoors with not tropical conditions, but where there's no threat of frost, right? They fit in nicely into a room that maybe isn't very well lit and doesn't have a ton of airflow and is just average average plant for an average room temperature wise humidity wise all of those things overall good plant all right let's go ahead and talk about the troubleshooting all the things that might go wrong things to watch out for yellowing fronds common happens a lot that can be caused from too much water if that's the case check the soil and how quickly water is moving through there to the drainage of that soil yellowing fronds can also be caused from too little water again check the soil if it's very dry and you have yellow fronds then well that's probably what's going on needs more water if they're yellow and it's sopping wet then that's what that was too much 
Nutrient deficiencies. If the frond is yellow and it's also the oldest growth on the plant, then it's probably a nitrogen problem. Increased fertilizer, maybe you need to repot the plant, might need to do both. Shock from temperature changes, light changes, airflow, humidity, those things can also cause yellowing fronds as well as brown tips and brown fronds. With the brown fronds, that usually means that they're not getting enough water, so the plant's been drying out. Check the soil. Or it can just be old foliage, like talked about earlier in the video about how they will just let their older growth age out and you have to prune that off. Salt buildup can also be a cause of those brown fronds. So you may need to do a heavy flush on the soil if you've been using a fertilizer that's heavy in salt, or maybe your water's just heavy in salt, or maybe you live in a salty area, I don't know. All the other things you don't think are a cause of the brown fronds, you might just need to give it a good flush or even better, probably take it out of the pot wash those roots out, get into a fresh mix. And what about brown tips? There's no way you're gonna be able to see that. They're barely brown. You can kind of see it. There's a little bit of brown on there. Not exactly the type of brown tip that I'm talking about. This is from the plant being in too much sun. There was some photo oxidation on here, bleaching, and then that's what died off on the plant. But in general, you probably know what I mean. That's where the edge of the pinnae, the little leaves that come off of the frond there, when those turn brown, that's a common thing, happens a lot. Dry air, drafts, all those things blowing on the plant. Plant might need more water or maybe just more frequent watering. Inconsistent watering, so being really good about watering the plant for a few months and then maybe not so good for a while, that can also lead to that. And again, salt buildup. The brown tips are usually where the brown fronds start. So, you know, back to everything I said before about the salt buildups. Orange, yellow, or brown spots. I don't have any of that to show on here, but it's not uncommon for it to happen because these tend to be very overwatered. And when plants are overwatered, a lot of problems can arise. If you're seeing orange or yellow or brown spots in the foliage, that can be a disease or deficiency. Sometimes can be caused by a pest. Potassium, usually the spots are going to be orange and or yellow. Magnesium, it's gonna be yellow on the pinnae in here. Just the little piece right there. Manganese, there'll be shriveled growth. That's going to be the growth that's coming out from the center. New growth will be shriveled, usually brown, maybe green with some brown on it. Increase the manganese. That's the, you need a palm fertilizer for that. Iron, this I can show you because there's some iron deficiency on mine and that's just going to be some mottled foliage. What I have going on here with mine is a combination of the plant being in a lot of sun. I really push the amount of light that this palm tree is getting. It really should be a deeper green than this. So to remedy that, I would take this plant and move it to more shade because I think that the sunlight has a lot to do with it and up the fertilizing. And I actually switched fertilizers just recently to one that will slightly lower my pH, making the iron more available to the plant. It should help push out some nice new deeper green foliage. On mine, the reason that I think the sun has a lot to do with the mottled foliage is because the new growth that's on the inside is a nice deep green and doesn't have that discoloration on it. But just to be safe, that's why I switched up my fertilizers so that I can attack this from both angles. A little bit less light and more iron with something available to adjust the pH because my water has a higher pH that's going to help make it so the iron's available to the plant. You get it. Nitrogen, talked about that. That's going to be yellowing foliage starting from the oldest growth. So down on the inside of the plant, see the yellowing, just go ahead and up your fertilizing. That'll usually do the trick for nitrogen. You may need to repot the plant, that's always a possibility. If you're unsure, isolate the plant, take pictures, go online, find a forum. Good things to search are things like palm tree deficiency, palm tree disease, palm tree pests. From the word identification at the end, that's helpful. You can also cut off a frond or some foliage, put it in a plastic bag and take it to a nursery and ask an expert in your area because sometimes the problems can be more common depending on where you live. And so it might be something that you'll get an answer to a little bit faster. And maybe they'll have a product right there for you so you can get right on top of treatment. The making sure it's in a bag thing, that is very important though, because if it is some kind of disease, you don't want to be spreading that to a, a nursery. Pests to watch out for on a power palm are going to be mealybugs, spider mites, thrips. Those tend to be the most common scale too. They have such thin, dainty foliage that pests tend to just really love these plants. If you notice something on there, the first thing to do is to take them to a sink or a shower, outdoors, blast them off with the hose, just get all the pests off there, the tops, the bottoms, everything. If it's mealybugs, I usually suggest going ahead and lifting the plant out, seeing if there's mealybugs down around the roots. If that's the case, you need to do a whole bunch of other things that I'm not gonna get into this video, it's too complicated. Spray them with a horticultural soap, oil, 
stay on top of that for several weeks and that will usually take care of that problem. With, with spider mites, increasing airflow and humidity after you've done all those things can help keep them at bay, keep the numbers down, make treatment more easy. Okay, and there, that's, it's so much. There's just so much with this palm tree just because so many people have them and there's so many freaking questions. <laughs> for an overall message to take, it would be that these tend to die very quickly from being overwatered and not having enough light. People put them in very dark rooms and they give them a ton of water and then they rot away. Don't do that. That'll kill the plant. If the, you have it in a very low lit area, even though the tag says they like low light and they like a lot of moisture, don't water them as much because they're going to be more prone to rot. Allow the top, I'd say two to three inches of soil, maybe even more than that to dry out in between waterings and you should be good. And if it seems like that's not enough, then you can increase watering. When you're unsure and learning the rhythm when it comes to watering a plant, err on the side of less than more because it's so much easier to bring a plant back from being dehydrated than from being overwatered. Checking for root rot. Look for foul odors. Is it stinky down in there? Is the soil very moist, consistently moist at all times? If that's the case, you're going to want to lift the plant, get it out of that mix, spray those roots down with a peroxide mix. Pardon the background noise, neighbors are putting in a pool. Spray them down with some peroxide, give them a rinse, Pot them into a fresh mix. If you use the same container, make sure you bleach or use alcohol, something to sanitize the container. And then don't, just don't stop overwatering it. And there it is. Fun plant, excellent plant. I think that they are so much fun to grow. I've enjoyed this one for many, many, many years. I especially like all the tiny little trunks that you start to get in here. You get like a mini bonsai effect with those tiny little ring trunks. They got the name Parlor Palm because I believe it was during the Victorian era was when they became very popular as a house plant to throw into the parlor, into a sitting room. Small plant that's unobtrusive. They just blend in well. They don't need a lot of light. They don't need a lot of anything, really. Comment down below, tips, tricks, suggestions, anything you can add to the conversation is helpful to the community. So go ahead and throw it down on in there. I hope everybody's doing well, having a great day, great life, and everything's just going beautifully for you. As always, and most importantly, everybody, keep on growing. Bye-bye.